with you. Uh, all of our Bibles are in there. You know, so some of you brought yours. Maybe if you've got your phone. Uh, now I'll look uh, Isaiah 53. Uh, I always uh, <coughs> seem like every year at Christmas I, I think about this passage of Scripture. It's one of the greatest passages of Scripture in all of the Word of God. Uh, it has been called the John 3.16 of the Old Testament. Of course, Isaiah has been called the evangelist of the Old Testament. And certainly he had, a, of course, he was a prophet, yes, by all means a prophet, by every means a prophet. But he was also a great evangelist. He had a yearning for the people of Israel to get close to God. And we'll uh, look at this probably in the next um, couple of mornings or so, look at some things out of uh, Isaiah 53. But this morning, I want to look at the prelude, the introduction to Isaiah 53, which is Isaiah 52, beginning with verse 13. And uh, I, a lot of times when you uh, read your Bible, I know I used to, and I still do, but out of habit, uh, I will observe the chapter divisions, which is wonderful. I'm glad we've got the chapter and verse divisions. What if I told you this morning, unroll your scroll and find Isaiah 53? And you're going down through all of, well, actually, it's this way, left to right. But uh, I'm glad we got chapters and verses that we can uh, designate and you can turn to and find it quickly. But uh, a lot of times we miss some uh, golden nuggets from God's Word by not by observing these chapter divisions. Actually, verse 13 of chapter 52 begins the subject matter that's dealt with in uh, chapter 53. So we'll look at those verses this morning and then maybe the next couple of mornings we'll look at some things in Isaiah 53. Notice what it says, Isaiah 52 verse 13. Behold, and I want you to notice that, the word is set apart by comma. I think it's very important to observe the punctuation marks in our English Bible. I know the, uh, the Hebrew manuscripts did not have uh, punctuation marks as we know it probably, but uh, we speak English. We don't speak Hebrew, we speak English. And so these punctuation marks are very important. It sets that word behold off to itself. There's uh, three different ideas when you read the word behold in the Bible. Think of this uh, from now on when you read these words. There's, there's a couple of ideas, maybe three ideas, that uh, revolve around this word behold in the Bible. It's calling our attention. Look is what it's saying. Now there's three different, uh, at least three different ways we look at something. We notice something as maybe it passes by. A car goes down the road, a car went down the road. But it pulls in the driveway, we look a little closer. Who's that pulling in my driveway? And uh, if someone gets out, comes to the door, we will really look closely, won't we? Uh, do they look like they might be wanting to cause trouble? Uh, observe what you do, you observe, you examine. Well, the idea when the comma sets it off is stop, look, listen, examine, examine. We're about to see something that needs to be uh, notice and attention needs to be paid to it. So behold, the next two words, my servant. Now we know who the servant is, don't we? Jesus Christ. And of course, this is prophetic of Christ. But uh, we are to observe him. Yes, as was so beautifully done this morning, he was the babe in the man manger. And uh, we, we praise God for that. So wonderful truths involved in that idea that Christ was born in the manger. But he grew up, 12 years old, we see him again. He continued to grow and mature in the Lord until we see him uh, traipsing up and down the length and breadth of uh, the nation, the land of Israel, preaching, healing, teaching, and uh, uh, preparing his disciples to go out into the world and spread the gospel of Jesus Christ after he ascended back to the Father. 
So we want to look at something. Behold, my servant, my servant. And uh, we get to chapter 53, and of course we know that's about his crucifixion. About his crucifixion, a wonderful chapter. A, a very hideous chapter, but a very wonderful chapter in the Word of God. And uh, so he's saying, now listen, this, this is what we're going to look at. And he gives in these verses 13, 14, 15, three stages in uh, the life of our Savior that we're to behold, we're to examine. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. As many were astounded at thee, his visage was so marred because of more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. So shall he sprinkle of many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him. Can you imagine a politician shutting his mouth for anything? Amen. But that's what it's saying. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. That which they had not heard shall they consider. Notice several things very quickly. As my time is very quickly passing. But I want you to notice he shall deal prudently. Prudently. That's verse 13. That speaks of wisdom. Prudent speaks of wisdom. Wisdom. You see, there's two ideas expressed in this word prudent. Actually, in wisdom, but it also speaks of enhancing prosperity. And, uh, uh, you know, God's the beginning of wisdom. The, uh, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And he's rich in his mercy and his grace toward us. And so, uh, uh, you know, we, uh, we're, we're to look, he's going to deal, whatever he does in chapter 53 is going to be wise. It's going to be full of wisdom. And uh, I got to thinking about that. That's amazing. That's amazing. What is wise about Christ being crucified? Well, everything you think about is wise about it. But here's the thing about it. The majority of the world, it mentions the kings that shall shut their mouths. The majority of the world doesn't see the wisdom in it. They don't understand the wisdom of God becoming man and then going to the cross to die for man. They don't understand the wisdom of that. And I don't have time this morning in this devotion to get into an extended uh, exegesis of uh, our salvation by grace. Uh, through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. I don't have time to do that. And uh, we've been in Sunday, most of us have been in Sunday school enough. We understand that, don't we? But what is wise about it? Why, why can't the world uh, see the wisdom in it? Simply because they don't understand the God who desires to forgive. <clears throat> Even the prophet Micah was amazed by it. In Micah chapter 7, verse 18, he said, Who is a God? like unto thee who pardoneth iniquity and passes by transgressions of the remnant of his uh, heritage. He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. Even Micah was amazed. Who's a God like this God? Tell me another God. Bring Confucius in here. Bring uh, 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 bring the, uh, all the gods. Bring them in here. March them in here. Tell me, do they delight in mercy? Of course not. Of course not. They want punishment. They seek punishment. I was in Thailand many years ago. A mission trip. Our church, church I was pastoring at the time. Had a missionary that uh, was a member of our church and he was in Thailand establishing churches and children's home and uh, just doing a great work and we were in one of the major cities of, uh, of the hill country of uh, Thailand as Chiang Rai and uh, we were walking by one of the public squares and my heart saddened to see a mother uh, bowing at a statue of Buddha and uh, that was sad enough but she had a little 11 year old daughter that was standing behind her with her hand on her shoulder and this mother would bow and chant some things 
Then she'd move around to the other side and bow it all the way around that statue. Uh, she did that with that little daughter uh, with her hand. Uh, that's sad. Oh, a God who delights in mercy is an unusual God. He's a wonderful God. He's a great God. But he should deal prudently. He should be exalted. That just simply means he's going to be lifted up. Yes, he was lifted up on the cross, but I believe this is talking about him being lifted up in resurrection and ascending back to the Father. And uh, we're taught that God uh, has promised to highly exalt him over in Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11. We don't have time to read all these verses. But God said he's, he'll be highly exalted. Then he said, he, and extolled. That word extolled, this is interesting. This word uh, extolled, the Hebrew word here is in a essay, nasa. Well, what do you think about when you hear the the acrostic in a an essay? Nasa, nasa. Well, the, the, what's interesting about it? The Hebrew word nasa means to be lifted up. To be lifted. Up. By the way, that Hebrew word nasa is. Translated in our Bible, our English Bible, I think it's 15 or 16 times, it's translated forgive. And that's exactly what God does when he forgives us. He lifts the burden of sin from our shoulder. Amen. I don't know uh, whoever thought of that across the uh, NASA. I don't know who thought that up. I doubt if they knew that. But oh, what a blessing it is. Uh, see, Barbara and I were raised on farms that was just about 50 miles south of Huntsville, Alabama. And uh, over there's where the NASA developed all those rockets. We can remember when the Saturn V rockets were being uh, developed. And uh, they lifted that rocket off the ground uh, into space. And, uh, well, what a wonderful the day the Lord came by and lifted our burden of sin. Somebody said, what did he do with it? Cast it behind his back and seal forgiveness. That's another great story. <clears throat> and the depths of the sea, the depths of the sea is not just the bottom, it's all the way through the silt and mud that settles in the bottom. That's what that word means. Our sins have been lifted. He shall be extolled. <clears throat> our sins have been lifted. And thank God for it. He'll be very high. I think that uh, he's talking about his majesty, the majesty of our Lord. Verse 14, and I must hurry, the wages of sin, <clears throat> the wages of sin. And many were stunned at his visage, and his visage was so marred, more than any man, <clears throat> and his form more than the sons of men. The wages of sin is still death. Did you know that? Did you know that? Sure you do. The wages of sin. And by the way, did you know this? I think you do. The wages of sin have never decreased. They're still the same. They're still the same. I've said it, other people have said it, that if you uh, look at this alcoholic, look at this druggy, look at this individual that's uh, uh, wasted their body, their physical energy on drugs and alcohol and permissive activity, and that that is what sin does to you and when you get a vision of sin and that's true but if you want to get a real vision of sin go to Calvary go to Calvary where Jesus died that's where we get our greatest illustration of what sin <clears throat> will do in the lives of people a stunned a stunned that word uh, has several different ideas but one that I like is awestruck Many people looked at it. They were all struck. They didn't understand the forgiveness of God. Why would God do this? Why? I look at myself and I, I beg to answer the question except for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The wages of sin. He took the wages of sin for us. See what he did? He took a death stand between us and hell. He stepped between the paymaster of sin and took the wages of sin for us. And now we are free. We are free. We are free to do what is in the first three words of verse 13, to behold the servant of the Lord. And then very quickly, and I close, i got one minute. 
so shall he sprinkle many nations. Well, we've uh, uh, we've seen the wages of sin. Here, I believe, we see the wonder of the second coming. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The king shall shut their mouths at him, for that which had not been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they wonder or consider. When he comes again, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. Amen. Kings don't understand this. All of their bragging, all of their politic, and all of their uh, ferocious uh, commands that they've set out throughout their countries will be brought into the light of an eternal judge who, know, who knows all, understands all, and nothing can be hid from him. He, they shall shut their mouths. Because that would, this is, this is where I want to close. This, this astonished me. That which they have not heard, shall they consider? They had not heard. Why hadn't they heard? That's my question. Why haven't they heard? I think the reason the kings of the earth have not heard is because they've not been told. And that's where you and I come in. Where to tell them. <clears throat> in my Bible college days in my evangelism class, my textbook was written by Dr. William Evans. It's an old textbook. The old textbook would have to be old if I had it in Bible college. <laughs> but uh, it's an old textbook. And Dr. Uh, Dr. Evans made this statement. And it stuck with me all through that whole semester of evangelism. This is what stuck with me. He said, it is not our responsibility to bring every man to Christ, but it is our responsibility to bring Christ to every man. Why had they not heard? They had not been told. As the old uh, gospel song they used to play when I was a kid growing up, I think a group by the name of Prophets don't know anything about them, but they the song and tell it again, tell it again. Salvation story repeat over and over. Till all the sons of men have heard it, and none can say they've never heard it before. I think I quoted that pretty close and anyway. got the gist of it. Tell it again, tell it again. Thank you. God bless you. Okay. I kept you two minutes over. You'll forgive me. <laughs> to the work, to the work.